Show Live, weekly talks with experts like you. Uh, we took a bit of a break over the last few weeks. Nearsoft had our team building week in the city of Querétaro, which was really fun, amongst other things. But we're rested and we're ready to head into our season three. Um, if you're new to Dojo Live, my name is Kim Lantis, joining you from Nearsoft's um, office in Hermosillo, Sonora, Mexico. Co-hosting with me today are my fellow Nearsoftians, Carlos Ponce in, in Mexico City, and um, Jorge okay. Simons joining us from Guadalajara, right? That's right. Hello. Perfect. We get to, at Nearsoft, we get to take advantage of working remotely and working from home as often as we like. Pretty well, within reason, of course. But so we get to do that. Um, today's guest is Joel Tram Trammell. I believe I said that right. Um, he'll be speaking to us about the tools that a tech company specifically CEO uses or might like to use and he knows what he's talking about folks because he is guess what a CEO of a tech company company named chorus that's chorus with a K so welcome to dojo live Joel glad to be here Kim <laughs> thank you um, so Joel please tell me a, us a bit more about yourself it's my understanding that you aspired to be and dreamt about being a CEO since you were pretty little like childhood is that correct yeah, that's that's right. I uh, started my first company when I was 25, and unlike a lot of entrepreneurs who did it because they had some problem they wanted to solve, uh, I wanted to be CEO, and no one would hire me at 25 to be CEO, so I had to start my own. <laughs> that's really cool. What was it that that called you so much to to be a CEO? Yeah, I uh, my first job out of college was teaching in the U.S. Navy. Uh, and I got a little bit of leadership experience. And uh, I remember one particular episode where I, I got in a heated argument with one of the people in my office about some issue. And, and I remember noticing that the person next to me who was kind of observing all of this was uh, white knuckled holding on to his chair. It was causing him so much anxiety while the two of us who were engaged in the discussion uh, actually enjoyed the argument. And it, it made me realize that people are, are very interesting creatures and led me to think about management and organizational theory and those kind of issues that a CEO gets to deal with. Very good. So 25, that's pretty young. What was your first company? That yeah, my, my first company was uh, being a uh, reseller of uh, PCs. At the time, uh, most PCs were custom built. Uh, they were uh, what we call white box PCs. And so I created a, a middleman distributorship for uh, people around the country who wanted to start their own PC business. Okay, so you've always had this inclination toward the technology side. I have, I got an electrical engineering degree because I enjoyed computers. And, and so I've always been in the software hardware fields. Very, very cool. So tell us about Chorus, your current company. Yeah, so Chorus uh, is kind of the culmination of my thought process around what it takes to be a good CEO. I, I wrote a book about uh, three years ago called The CEO Tightrope, where I tried to put a system around the job of the CEO. And it was very interesting when I started that book, I realized that um, really no one's thought about the CEO job systematically. And particularly in the software world, we've spent the last 25, 30 years computerizing all the functional aspects of a business. So there's software for the salesperson, there's software for the marketing person, there's software for the CFO. And we've left the CEO with email and calendaring and just decided that they're so smart, they're supposed to be able to figure it all out. And so the, the vision of Chorus is that the CEO needs a platform to run the organization. And that's a very unique job. And so there's you know unique things that the CEO is responsible for. So let's talk about those unique things um, and your experience um, as a CEO and of course I'm sure you have many, many colleagues that you've discussed and the time and effort and investigation it took to build something like Chorus. Um, what makes it different? What are those obligations and what have you learned? The do's, the don'ts? And sure. So there's a lot of things but you know one of the key concepts I teach CEOs is the idea of managing the future. And so almost everyone in a company uh, other than the CEO is focused on the past and present. There's software to be written, there's contracts to be closed, there's marketing to be done, there's customer problems from yesterday to be dealt with. But the CEO, the leader of any organization is tasked with setting direction for the company. And so they should be spending the majority of their time thinking about the future, managing the future, dealing with information, anticipating the future. 
And it's very easy in our data centric worlds to get focused on the past. Data by definition is something that's already happened. It's historical. And if a CEO only has data to run the company by, my view is that's like driving a bus by looking in the rear view mirror and then wondering why you're always hitting things in the road. That's the way many companies are run today. They're all very data specific and that's great for the functional heads who are dealing in the past and present. But the leader needs to think about things very differently and get information about the future. Very good. So let's talk about that future, this idea of dreaming. What are some, before we move on to more specifics, of course, but how do you manage that? How do you, Joel, think about the future? What are the things that have you found to help be successful in that? Yeah, so it hit me one day. I used to sit around in an operations review meeting each week in a company I was running. And we would spend about 90% of our time talking about the sales forecast. And when I left the meeting, I would always feel like something was missing. Why did we just spend 90% of our time talking about sales forecast? Sales forecast is important in a company, but it's not 90% of everything that you do. And it hit me one day as I left the meeting that the reason we did that was because sales was by process the only group that was giving me information about the future. They made a forecast. And so my thought was, how could I get every other group in the organization to give me a forecast, give me information about the future? And so one of the ways to think of Chorus is a genericized sales forecasting process across the whole company. Let's, instead of asking people where they are and somebody telling you you're 80% done on a project, well, they could be 80% done and have no clue how to do the last 20%. They could be 20% done and know exactly how they're going to knock out the last 80%. As the leader of the organization, what you want to know is how likely are you to complete the project on time and on schedule. All right, very cool. And so that's what Chorus helps facilitate. So it's a tool for the CEO, but everyone in the company is involved? Yeah, it, it's really for every everyone in the company's inputting predictions. It's for, it's, it puts together kind of a consistent management system. I mean, one of the things I realized when we grew one year from 100 people in the company to 200 in 12 months was that there was now this whole new layer of management in the company. And I had no idea how they managed the employees. While I probably, you know, sensed how my particular direct reports ha handled management, there was no consistent management process. So how an employee was treated was somewhat random based upon their particular manager in the organization. And so, you know, part of this is to give people a consistent way to manage people. Do we set goals across the organization? Do we have clear measurements and deliverables? Do we make predictions? Do we meet weekly to discuss those predictions? Do we finalize the results? All these are kind of basic management structure that a lot of companies talk about doing, but rarely ever implement. Mm -hmm. So is it a challenge for companies or for yourself to kind of develop that culture of predictions to get people used to doing that or even to teach people how to do that? Yes. So most people in their jobs are not used to making and being held accountable to predictions. Um, but that's really the change. If you look about um, the, the nature of kind of the management job, when Deming and Drucker and some of the great management theorists were writing their books, they always talked about manufacturing operations. And I realized one day the reason they did that is because it's easy to run a manufacturing operation in the sense that you don't have to talk to the employee on the assembly line and figure out how many seats he's or how many cars he's going to build today. Uh, you can just watch him come off the assembly line. And so in, in that model, employees were kind of interchangeable and you didn't need to get information from them and you didn't really need to communicate much information to them. But when you change to the type of work a company like Nearsoft does, uh, I haven't figured out how you watch a software developer and figure out when he's going to be done. You have to actually ask that person uh, and get information back from that person about when they're going to be done. So it's kind of the changing nature of work is what's led to you need a different structure to your management system. Mm -hmm. And perhaps a different structure to management. And then training <laughs> of management and a whole bunch of other things that implies. Right. Um, Nearsoft ourselves, we're actually a, a flat organization. We don't actually mm -hmm. have managerial titles. Are you familiar with that or is that something that Chorus has experimented with? 
Sure. So I, I'm certainly familiar with, uh, you know, the various, there's, there's kind of a continuum of management approaches. Um, uh, I am not, uh, you know, I think you can go too far in either direction. You can certainly be too command and control, but I think you can also lose people uh, if there isn't, if there aren't ability to get answers to questions quickly and make decisions in an organization. Is there, uh, most, most of the time when we talk about like changing the way we manage a company or, or, or the way uh, companies work, we, we go to the software industry because it's a very unique industry. Uh, do you think this methodology you're talking about uh, can work for different industries, of maybe construction, maybe something else? What's your experience in that? Yes, yeah, so it's been surprising. We have a very wide range of industries that uh, support it because more and more work is knowledge work these days. Even some of the traditional industries that you would say construction, for as, as the example you use, well, that's becoming much more a knowledge work job, much more computerized, much more uh, involved in, the, in, in and in not, you know, now we have machines to do all the ditch digging and the, and the standard kind of mechanical things that people did historically. So we found a wide range of industries that are adopting this kind of approach. Very cool, thank you. Um, um, I have a, I have a, I'm sorry, Kim. No, no, I was just uh, going to I'm, ask you. <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah, I have a, I have a question that just popped up into my mind right now. Mm, and, uh, and it kind of ties into what you mentioned that people can go too far on one direction. I mean, either in one, one direction or the other. And when Kim mentioned the, the flat organization thing, but, uh, the, the tools that you propose, the tools that you're talking about when you say tools for the tech company, uh, CEO, um, are how, I'm just trying to word my thoughts. I'm a little, I'm, I'm a little slower than Jorge and Kim, so please bear with me. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, the tools you're talking about, how can these tools be put to, uh, to best use when it comes to dealing with more subjective elements of an organization, like such as, for example, uh, culture or bonding or communication or soft skills, uh, how, how can these tools improve these subjective or more ethereal aspects of the organization, particularly in a flat organization just like ours? Is, is that, does that apply for the tools yeah. that you mentioned? So, you know, culture is a huge aspect. It's one of the five responsibilities of the CEO. I, I talk about the CEO owns the culture. Uh, they are like mom and dad of the family uh, and that they, you know, have responsibility kind of for everything that goes on. And when you get to a certain size, you got to start talking with people about culture. I'm a big fan of measuring culture too. I think some of the engagement surveys, I mean, Gallup has a product called Q12 that I'm a big fan of used for years that, provides uh, uh, a survey and, and allows you to rate yourself against their other data in the database, similar companies of your size on their 12 key questions. Uh, I think most people don't do an, near enough around managing the workforce. One of the comments I often make, I sit on several boards and uh, you know, to me, the CEO job, you've got to balance the requirements of employees, shareholders and customers. And often, especially as a company gets mature, I see a lot of data about shareholders and I see very little data about the employees and often even very little data about the customers. And I'll hear people say, oh, well, you know, our employees love us. They think we're great or the customers think we're great. Uh, but there's very little data around that while they have eight degrees of precision around their financial statements. And so I'm a big believer in using tools. Uh, you know, both survey tools, anonymous survey tools. If you're a big enough company, where Glassdoor and some of those products, you know, paying attention to what people are saying in those forums um, and getting information about the employees is critical if you want to understand what the culture is really like and whether you're making a difference in the culture. You had mentioned you. something about five key concepts for CEOs. I believe one of those then is managing the future. Another is owning the culture that you've touched on. Am I getting those right? Well, so yeah, so the five are uh, own the vision. Uh, so that's the future, right? Telling the story to everyone about what the vision, what's the direction, what mission are we signing up for? 
Uh, provide the proper resources is the second. You've got to put the right capital in place. You've got to find the right people uh, at the key positions to make it happen. Uh, then you can think about building the culture, number three. Uh, making decisions is number four, and that's not you personally as the CEO making decisions only. That's also teaching the organization how to make decisions. Uh, one of the things I often observe, I, I can tell more about a company by sitting 30 minute or hour long meeting where they're trying to make a decision than just about anything else because you, you'll, you'll see all the signs. Is everyone waiting for the CEO and looking at him trying to figure out you know, what, what, which way he's leaning before they commit? Uh, is there healthy discussion? Are people questioning the assumptions? Uh, all kinds of things in that piece. And then finally, number five is deliver performance. And, Everybody understands the CEO is ultimately responsible for performance of the company, but often people skip to that one uh, and focus only on the winning piece. And that would be like a football coach walking in the locker room and saying, hey guys, go win. Well, the, you know, in American football, the right guard, he doesn't know how to win, he knows how to hit people. And so you've got to build a, a detailed playbook of exactly what he's going to go do. Who does he go hit? first and then if he blocks that guy, who else does he block? And so often on, around delivering performance, there's not a lot of detail on how the team's going to go win. I like I like that analogy a lot. So I imagine, Joel, that in your time as CEO, you've had some low points and some high points. Which have been more valuable to you? Oh, mistakes are, are infinitely more valuable. Uh, than successes. You never know with a success what actually caused it. Sometimes you just get lucky. Um, it's like pilots who study flying uh, study all the crashes that have happened in that particular plane uh, because you, you don't learn anything watching somebody fly a plane through the sky and no, no issues happen. You learn from when they crashed the plane uh, what was the mistake they made. And so uh, mistakes, and I don't even look at them necessarily as mistakes. I think from the CEO perspective, you're constantly making decisions. Many of them are going to be the wrong decision. You need to just kind of understand that up front. And so that the goal is to rapidly correct bad decisions, not to think you're so smart, you're going to make all the right decisions. No, you should understand you're going to make a bunch of wrong decisions. So build everything around quickly correcting those decisions and moving on. So is that decision making element a part of course tool? Like, are you able to track the, the, the good and the bad or are well, you just... You set up clear objectives and, and measurements so that we know whether people are actually achieving, you know, what they said and being held accountable to what they said they were going to do. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of the tool being very um, holistic for, for everyone. Um, do you choose to, are there ways to keep course, how open do you choose to keep it or is there that ability to keep it to your company? Like is, do you go toward transparency or is it very much decided who gets to see what or what are your recommendations there? Yeah, but I, I'm very much a, a big fan of open book management, have been for, for many years and, and the transparency. You, you can't build trust in an organization. Uh, if, if you don't have transparency. Obviously, occasionally there are facts, uh, maybe about an individual person or something you need to keep out of the public eye. But in general, uh, if you can't share your detailed plans of how you're going to win with your employees, I don't know uh, how you hope to be successful. And so Chorus by default is, is very transparent. Everybody can see everything uh, unless specific allowance is made. So we default towards transparency. Uh, there's something, there's a point uh, that I always discuss with our particular CEO, which is Roberto, uh, which is like, I, I feel like he has like the, the general point of view, like he understands every moving component of the company from like the top, like with a hog's eye view. And one of the discussions we have is how we can communicate that. And I think it goes a lot with what you said about having all the information you need to make decisions. So the question after all that, <laughs> the question would be something like, uh, how do you inspire others and, and make sure they have the right information to act upon? Because you, you as a CEO have like a privileged point of view. How can you share that with others, with your employees or your colleagues? 
Yes, yeah, so it's important to understand what information you need uh, to make a decision and, and kind of how you make decisions. So, you know, the interesting difference, the CEO position, in almost every other position, the people that make decisions have an expertise in their particular functional area. If you're in a traditional organization and you're the VP of sales, for instance, somebody brings a problem to your desk, it's a sales problem. And you are probably the best person to address that problem because you've been doing sales all your life. And that's why you're the VP of sales. And while you may have not seen that exact same problem before, you've seen something like it. But now if one day you take the sales guy and make him CEO, nine out of the 10 problems that come to their desk aren't going to be sales problems. As the CEO, you have to realize you have to make decisions very differently than you do when you're the expert. When you're the expert, you just say, give me all the data. I will analyze the data because I'm the expert on this particular problem. Or you have to think about it very differently. You have to start figuring out who is the expert. What, are, are they clear on my mission and vision so that they can use their expertise to make a recommendation that's consistent with the mission and vision? So it's much more of a communication exercise, the role of the CEO, where you're trying to make sure everybody that's making all these decisions that know way more about the problem than you do are making the same decision you would make if you had that expertise. Because it's a lot easier to communicate the mission and vision and goals of the company down than it is for you to become an expert in every area of your company. I've been doing this 25 years and I'm still not an expert in any of the things we do. Uh, and so my, my job is to communicate down to the company the mission, vision, values of the organization so that the experts at each level can make the right decisions. Nice. You make it sound simple. <laughs> <laughs> it's no, easy. I, I really, really like that. It's easier to communicate the mission and the vision down than it is for you as a CEO to become an expert at every level of the company. So in your 20 years, the biggest walk takeaway for you is probably that humility. Do you need to be a humble person? Is that a key ingredient? Yeah. So the two things I say, if you, you know, just two factors that explain the success, I think of, of many of the very successful CEOs are what I would say, they have to be smart in a learning sense. They have to be able to learn very quickly but then they have to have the self-awareness to know what they know and won't know what they don't know. And so a lot of times people ask me, well, you know, do you have to have 25 years of experience to be a good CEO? Well, Mark Zuckerberg's been a pretty good CEO without any experience. What's the difference? Well, he was really smart because he got bored at Harvard. You got to be a pretty good learner to get bored at Harvard, right? <laughs> uh, but second, he has shown, which is a rarer trait, a great deal of self-awareness. He brought Sheryl Sandberg because he recognized what he knew and recognized what he didn't know and that he needed a partner who could provide a lot of the values he couldn't provide. So those are the two pieces, which you can find one or the other often, but putting the two together. And so humility is part of that self-awareness, right? Knowing that you just don't know everything, that you don't have to be the smartest person in the room, um, that other people need to get the credit for things. Uh, they're all part of kind of, I would uh, group under the category of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. the, the other people need to, uh what is it that you just said? To be recognized for things or something? Need to get credit. Credit. Okay, yeah. thank you. So that brought me to recognition. Is recognition an element in chorus? Uh, that's a funny you oh, should ask recognition. that. Recognition. The second time that topic's come up today. Um, so it if it isn't, true. there it needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll wait for my commission check. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. um, it, 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 we haven't figured out how to do it well where it's not perceived as juvenile, I would say. So there's a, there's a very thin line, you know, um, it, 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 you got to be careful in a work environment that we're not all just, you know, balloons and hearts, because that's not really the nature of what we're doing. We're not looking at cat videos on Facebook, right? Work environment. Um, and so we haven't well, figured- we are. <laughs> well, we are, but uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a platform for that, right? And so how do we integrate uh, recognition in a professional business way is a challenge that, you know, we'd love to get ideas on that uh, because I've seen it done, but a lot of times it, it, I don't think it's helped the company 
uh, when they've implemented things like that, because in a lot of cases, it just gets very, very juvenile kind of quickly. In juvenile, what's your perception on that? Like, there, um, can you expand on that in the sense of uh, well, popularity contests or getting recognized for silly things, or how do yeah, you mean people, people start, you know, just, you know, the natural sarcasm. Maybe I've lived around too many software developers who have a natural sarcastic streak uh, to, to start creating medals for, for every reason or, or seeing who can get the most medals or badges or whatever. And it, and it just doesn't really, you know, uh, perform the value that you want to perform. I, I remember when we started, uh, let's say, creating like a software or using a software for contributions, you would, we, we are a very few food oriented community and we would get <laughs> recognized for like bringing donuts to the office and stuff like that. So it we right. it was a sort of like a learning uh, experience. We had to learn how to recognize others, and it was very. Uh, I think a very. It might sound silly, like to say thanks to someone, but it it's a very profound topic. If you have again the CEO view of it and how it manages the culture, it's it's quite difficult. It's not an easy thing. Yeah, it's actually recognition is a, a topic that we as a company are working on right now. It was actually one of the main topics of our team building week that we just had two weeks ago. Um, for your knowledge, and I'm sure you've probably heard of it, um, the platform we currently use for that is Seven Geese. Um, mm -hmm. so if you, um, and, and the really fun thing that one of our offices does, the Chihuahua office, is they have something called the, the Menon de Oro, the Golden Mennonite. Um, there's a large Chihuahua in Mexico, for those of you who don't know, is um, known to have several large Mennonite um, communities. And so that's why it's a, and Mexicans are good at, you know, poking fun of anything and everyone around them. So it's a cultural thing. But, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, oh, the on, point Kim. is, it's really cool. How can, they have, how can you tell that, Kim? How can I you tell? <laughs> but they have, mine is, this is the award I got for a recycling challenge. But it's like a, they have a statue that's a mimic, a mock-up of a, a, a Oscar. And the idea is, you, as a an office, they recognize somebody for doing the small things that you appreciate. And the rule is um, you get them the the golden Mennonite, the men in the oral, and you have it there um, on your desk, which makes you feel good, of course. But you can only keep it for a week, which means you have to be on the lookout for um, somebody else who's somebody else who has done something that um, you appreciate. And so it can be something silly like bringing donuts or it can be something rather profound. Um, but I think that's obviously it's hard to put that into a software element, but um, the idea of recognition, I think, going back to that is really key element. Oh, there's no there's question. In the, in the Gallup Q12 I referenced, one of their questions is, in, in the last seven days, have you see, received recognition or praise for doing a good job? And uh, that, that very specific question, in the last seven days, is uh, very telling. And it's, it might be even a tougher question. In the last seven days, have you given recognition? Well, that, that could be a good question, too. <laughs> Very cool. Um, um, Jorge, uh, Carlos? Yeah, I, yes. I was reminded. Oh, should I go or you, Carlos? Whatever. No, go, go ahead, ahead, please. Go I, ahead. No, I was reminded. Uh, uh, actually, uh, hold on one second, Jorge. Uh, I'd like to just pause for one second to remind the audience that you can send us, should you have any questions for Joel, uh, feel free to send them over right here on uh, on Twitter at Dojo Live. Very simple, very straightforward. Just send it over at Dojo Live. You know how to do it. You know Twitter. Most of you do. <laughs> okay. And so, with that being said, uh, just send them over, and we'll read them back to Joel, and he'll respond here live on Dojo Live. Okay. Back to you. Oh, I was reminded of a phrase. Uh, uh, Joel said something very similar to to Roberto which his, his number one phrase is something like, always hire people that are smarter than you. And it, it, it sort of made me realize that was something that, that Joel was saying, which was uh, m let people make decisions. So if you hire people that are smarter than you in certain areas, that would be like um, a very good idea. So th my question would be, after all that again, <laughs> is what would be like the number one rule? Or That's Roberto's number one uh, catchphrase or, or advice, what would be your number one advice to someone who's just up and coming and wants to be an entrepreneur? I know it's a hard question and it's unfair, but you're live, man. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so a slight perturbation of his of his question. If you're hiring somebody and you're not willing to trust them to make decisions in the area you're hiring, then you're hiring the wrong person, is the way I would put it. Now, the, the smarter than you is kind of the subset of that, but you, obviously you're, not everybody's going to be smarter than you. Some, you know, smarter, what does that mean? But exactly. what it really means to me when I hire somebody is, do I trust them in their area of expertise to make decisions? And am I not going to second guess every decision they make? And so that that's what I, that's the point I would put on it. How do you identify trust when you go through that process? Do you trust your gut? You have a series of questions. Do you look, what's yeah, that process for you? I once did that year. Uh, I told you about, we hired a hundred people in 12 months. I did 252 interviews in that one year. Uh, and so after you do 252 of just about anything, you get pretty good at it. <laughs> uh, but, but one of my favorite questions is some version, and, and this actually came about by accident. So those of you who are looking to interview for Chorus, pay attention. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was scheduled to do an interview, and normally I re reviewed the resume and, provide, and, and, and wrote down two or three questions to kind of break the ice to get started. One day somebody came in, and I hadn't had time to review their resume, and all I saw was they were interviewing for a PR position. Look, I don't know anything about PR. I've never done PR. We've never had a PR dedicated person. Tell me what makes a great PR person. And they and spent the next three minutes giving me a very systematic, well thought out approach, what they would do in the first 30 days, what they do in 90 days, what PR value provided to the organization. And what I realized is people who are very good at a, a skill can talk about it forever. Uh, because they've thought a lot about it. You don't become good at something unless you spend a lot of your time thinking about it and practicing it. One of the things I often see on TV, like they talk to Jordan Spieth, who's one of the best golfers in the world. I actually get bored during the interview because he finds golf far more interesting than I do. He can talk about, oh, well, the ball was lying this way in the grass, and so I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about that, and you're like, I don't really care, Jordan. Just how'd you hit the shot? But... <laughs> The people who are great at something have practiced it, have thought about it, have, have developed systems for it. And so if they can't explain it to you uh, in a way that makes a lot of sense, they probably don't really know what they're doing very well. Mm. Definitely. I like okay, uh, Kim. Uh, hold on one second, guys. Um, you got uh, Echo? Yeah, I think you're... you're external mic on your laptop must be picking you up or something and then playing it back. I'm it, too. it was not really. It was okay. But anyway, there, no, it, 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 wait, wait, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. Um, okay. Joel, I have a question for Joel, uh, but uh, Jorge, do you have anything before we move on? Uh, I was just going to say that uh, it sounds like Joel likes to hire nerds. And I think we, we do too. Like, <laughs> People that really like what they do, no matter if it's really boring to others, because I, I think we can talk to anyone at Nearsoft and probably at Chorus and have like an hour long conversation about one connector of, of some sort of software. And I think that's really good advice. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to okay. make sure that our recruiting team puts that into effect ASAP. What makes a good Java developer? What makes a good <laughs> recruiter? What makes a good <laughs> perfect? Yeah. Really awesome question. I, I have a question for Joel, if I may. And when you were thinking of building this particular tool, and of course we're talking about software, which is geared towards CEOs, and you being a CEO have a, you know what you wanted. You had you wanted to have it done in a specific way because you knew who you were trying to target. But when it came to when the time came to actually build the software, you know that entails teams that are usually comprised of a lot of people with very different personality traits, or who might be. Uh, and I'm not talking about the hiring process; you know, that's something else. But I'm talking about actually working with people who might be different to you, to you as the leader of the project. Yeah. At some point, I don't know if this was the case. I'm just asking you if. When you were building the tool, when you were working with teams, 
you experience any kind of, I don't know, glitches in communication or any kind of, you know, differences that kind of uh, made it difficult to build a tool the way you wanted it? And if so, how did you overcome it? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. Um, so unfortunately, everybody I hire can't have had experience being a CEO. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so often uh, that's why I, ask. <laughs> I have to, to go back and, and understand what are they not getting, what, I, what have I not explained, because they often will come back with things that, uh, you know, if you were a CEO, you just wouldn't think about it that way in general. I mean, even our product as a whole, some people think our product's an HR uh, product because it has goals in it. And everything they know that has goals in it is an HR product. And I have to explain to them, no, we're not an HR product. We're this unique thing for the CEO. Um, and, and, and yes, developers, uh, you know, product managers, I, I, you know, certainly they can talk to customers, but it's hard. You know, one of the things I teach in my course is the CEO role is just unique. Uh, there just isn't another role in the company that's equivalent. Things about that role that until you've experienced it, it's really hard to appreciate. And so it is a challenge in building software when you're specifically focused on that role, uh, because most of the people that are building it have never, you know, to them, the CEO is some, you know, person sitting in the chair that knows everything, right? I appreciate it, Joel. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, okay, I got a couple of others, but uh, okay. I'm okay. I'm out of questions. <laughs> We're out of questions. Cool. All right. So, Kim. No, I, I don't have any um, particular questions left for Joel myself either, other than um, which, of course, we can get to your questions first, but I just wanted to make sure, Joel, that you let our viewers know um, where they could go ahead and pick up your, your book if interested, The CEO Tightrope. Uh, where to know more about chorus or even where to know more about um, these classes and workshops um, that you provide. So um, before we do sign off, I, I think it's um, be cool for you to share that information, but Carlos, by all means. Sure, uh, well, uh, actually, well, two things, and uh, this is just a little note that I have, and uh, this just for clarification purposes, and the information that we shared publicly uh, on social media and on Twitter and such, yeah, we, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Joel, uh, this is about your note about uh, the you being the chairman emeritus of the Austin Technology Council, not the current chairman, right? That, that's that's right. Not the current chairman, yes. <laughs> yeah, that, I just wanted to clarify that. So thank you for that. Uh, so Joel is, a, is the chairman emeritus of the Austin Technology Council. So not the current chairman. That's just in case you found out about Dojo Live on social media and all the marketing uh, on the promotion that we're doing. So that's that. Okay, now back to, uh, I have only um, one more question. Rather than a question, I, I think it would be a, um, a request to elaborate on how you, in the, when you're talking about the using of these tools to make organizations great, and uh, when you say we focus on people, right? And that's right on your website. What do you mean by this? Can you elaborate on this a little bit? Yeah, so it, it gets back to the concept uh, that I discussed earlier that most businesses today are filled with knowledge workers. And uh, the definition okay. of a knowledge worker is they uh, have more information about doing their job than you can possibly have. Okay, and so again, software development is a perfect example. I can't watch a software developer know when they're going to complete the project. They have to tell me if I want any information about them. And so managing knowledge workers is very different uh, in a lot of ways than the old manufacturing operation where it was basically, oh, we have this HR group that hires people to work on the manufacturing line and if one quits, we just run another one on and there's no change, right? Um, you know, when you're running a, a shop of knowledge workers, there, there's just a whole different level of skills and, and you have to integrate managing the people with managing the business. And too many organizations are still set up in an old traditional model of they manage the people separate from running the business. And that just doesn't work in a knowledge, knowledge working environment. So one of the unique things we do in Chorus is we use the same data that we use to run the business 
to manage the people. And that's a unique thing that's very different, whereas current, most almost all performance management systems have the manager create data or the employee create data or the friends of the employees create data or all these different kind of funny data things that everybody knows really isn't related to the day-to-day -day running of the business. And so one of the things we do at Chorus is integrate the data used to run the business with the management of the people. And so I think that's critical for companies moving forward that consist mostly, again, of knowledge workers and not the t traditional factory people standing on a, a machining uh, or manufacturing assembly line. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, okay. We, we are approaching the final segment, the final minutes of today's conversation. So, um, I'd like to pretty much pass on the mic to do to you, Joel. If you have any uh, any other any final you know uh, uh, suggestions or any final comments about uh, you know for CEOs who might be watching either now or in the upcoming future, and of course where we can learn more about Chorus or uh, your courses, pretty much anything you would like to share with the audience. Uh, whether watching now or live or the uh, an upcoming uh, episodes. Sure, thank, thanks uh, for the opportunity. Yeah, if you're interested in more uh, of my thoughts on the role of the CEO, uh, I operate uh, www.theamericanceo.com. So you can go to theamericanceo.com and get a book. There's a course available if you want to sign up for a course, video course on the role of the CEO. I've been teaching a course here in Austin uh, for the last seven or eight years. And so there's a video version of that course available. Uh, we do regular blog postings, regular interviews with CEOs. So there's a lot of great material on the American CEO. And then Chorus uh, spelled K-H-O-R-U-S because I was too cheap to buy the C-H domain name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the idea was everyone singing from the same page of the book. And so, you know, what we end up with it, with Chorus when you implement Chorus is a playbook for what everybody's going to go do uh, to make an organization successful. And most organizations don't have a playbook. And I'm a big fan that every organization needs a playbook for how they're going to be successful. So you can check us out at chorus.com. I kind of like the idea, you know, the playbook. So Jorge, we should make a note of that and maybe discuss it for upcoming uh, uh, team building Content weeks or meeting. something, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, okay. Uh, Hold on one second. All right. So, uh, Kim, Jorge, we're about to, uh, we're approaching the final minutes. So, do you have anything else for Joel before we sign off? And of course, if not, then uh, Kim, I'll leave it up to you to <laughs> to do the closing as you usually do. And I just, again, I, I love the way you do it. You're graceful. That, so, it's your show. <laughs> Now I don't know how graceful I'm going to be. <laughs> <laughs> no, Joel, really, um, I really enjoyed our talk today. I think um, you are a man of wisdom who has um, learned from his past to look toward his future, and that's that's really exciting for me. I've got a lot of cool little tidbits. Um, learned a lot myself today. Um, interested to take a deeper look um, into chorus. So before um, we sign off, I guess, is there just any last words of wisdom you'd like to share with us? Well, the reason for the title of the book, The CEO Tightrope, and what I sign on every uh, autographed copy is keep your balance. The key to the CEO role is, is never the extremes, it's always in the middle. And so Ooh. keep your balance is the, is the key concept. That's a good one, definitely. Oh, about, by the way, uh, for those of you folks who are watching now, uh, all the information that uh, Joel has shared regarding his course and his book and pretty much everything. It's all going to be just stay tuned for uh, on the Dojo Live website and, of course, uh, today's episode because all the information is going to be in there. So, uh, Joel, if whenever you, you're ready, just share that info with me and we'll add it to the page and it'll be all there for the world to, to take advantage of and, of course, uh, learn a lot from what you're going to be sharing with the world. So, okay. with that being said... Kim? Yes, yeah, so that being said, thank you very much for your time today, Joel, Jorge, Carlos. It's a pleasure. And um, let's just keep balancing, everybody. <laughs> and for those of you who'd like to join us um, next week, Dojo Live will be here every Wednesday, um, 3 o'clock Central. So 
Perfect. Thank you once thank again. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Jorge. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you.